sin, nobody but Jesus, who pulled me out of that pit, he did, he did, who paid for all of our sin, nobody but Jesus. We continue in our Luke series. We'll be reading today chapter 14, verses 1 through 24. And thank you to Philip for being on the uh, computer today. Um, I understand there's a little bit of issues with our text, so uh, I'm just going to hope the right verses are up there. And if it's not, we're just going to roll through it. Uh, but understand that that's the hottest seat right now to be the tech guy and have tech issues. So we, we appreciate your patience. Now, if you remember from last week, right, there was a healing in, in chapter 13. A woman had been bent over for 18 years. She had been uh, disfigured for 18 years. And so Jesus heals her on the Sabbath. And do you remember what one of the Pharisees said to Jesus? Okay, Jesus, there are six days out of the week to heal, and you chose to heal this woman on the Sabbath. How dare you? And Jesus' response to her was, what would you do if one of your kids fell into a ditch or one of your livestock fell into a ditch? Would you not pull them out? So our text today has a very similar moment. And I want you to notice the similarities here. But what happens in our text now happens at a dinner, at a, at a Sabbath meal. And, and our text begins right here. So I'm going to read to you Luke chapter 14, verses 1 through 6. One Sabbath, listen carefully to how this is worded. One Sabbath, when Jesus went to eat in the house of a prominent Pharisee, he was being carefully watched. There in front of him was a man suffering from abnormal swelling of his body. Jesus asked the Pharisees and experts in the law, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? But they remained silent. So taking hold of the man, he healed him and sent him on his way. Then he asked them, if one of you has a child or an ox that falls into a well on the Sabbath day, will you not immediately pull it out? And they had nothing to say. So listen to this. He goes to a Sabbath meal, one in the home of a prominent Pharisee. This was being hosted by a prominent Pharisee, and he was being watched. So we know that they're looking for something. They're looking for some way to trip Jesus up. And listen to this. If you went to a Sabbath meal at the home of a prominent Pharisee, remember, these guys are all about being ritually clean. These guys are all about their righteousness. And so there's no way that they would have in their midst, in this man's home, a prominent Pharisee, a man who was suffering from abnormal swelling. He would have been considered unclean. So here's what we have. Jesus in the home of a prominent Pharisee. They're all watching him, and there's a guy who's a setup. You know what Jesus just walked into? A trap. And look what Jesus does. He goes headfirst into this trap, and he springs it. And he asks them a question. Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? And what do they say? Nothing. Nothing. Silence. So taking hold of the man, listen, so taking hold of the man whose only hope comes from Jesus of Nazareth. He heals him, sends him on his way. Now, I want you to notice something. If you remember from last week, both the man that was healed this week, the, at the swollen man, and the woman who was bent over, both are passive in this scripture. Neither of them asked to be healed, but Jesus heals them. Neither of them did anything worthy of being healed, but Jesus touches them and heals them. Okay? Both were healed through no effort or righteousness of their own. Both let Jesus do his thing. And this is one way to live. To let Jesus do for you what you cannot. To be touched by Jesus so that it, what is crooked in your life can be straightened. To be taken hold of Jesus like the man in our passage. So that what is broken, what is inflated, what has been torn apart, what is evil and depraved, what is sinful and wretched and wicked be put to death through the work of Jesus Christ. And all you have to do is turn to Jesus. That is one way to live. You see, the people who were healed and set free simply let Jesus do what only Jesus can do. But the Pharisees, the experts in the law, the religious elite who trusted in their goodness, who trusted in their work, couldn't understand this. 
This is grace. So imagine this scene now. I'm going to read from 7 to 11. After this healing, Jesus looked around the room and he made an observation. When he noticed how the guests picked the places of honor at the table, he told them this parable. When someone invites you to a wedding feast, do not take the place of honor for a person more distinguished than you may have been invited. If so, the host who invited both of you will come and say to you, give this person your seat. Then humiliated, you will have to take the least important place. But when you are invited, take the lowest place so that when your host comes, he will say to you, friend, move up to a better place. Then you will be honored in the presence of all the other guests. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. So imagine this scene. Imagine if you, on a Sunday morning, you came to Lakewood Grace. And, and, and coming through those doors are people who say, yeah, I love Jesus. I love God. I love the Holy Spirit. That's how I live. I, 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 I know I'm called to love God and love others as myself. I know all those things, but imagine, imagine if everybody who professes those things started elbowing one another to get to the front, the front row, right? Can you imagine Miss Shirley over here throwing elbows because somebody's in her seat? <laughs> Right? And, and here's the thing. Here's, here's what Jesus noticed. He goes, look, everybody here around this Sabbath table has pushed one another around to try to get the most honored seat. And imagine if, imagine if the folks who come and they try to get the honored seat don't do it because they want to hear the message, don't do it because uh, they don't want distractions during the worship. They want to do it because sitting in the front row makes them look holier than everybody else sitting in the cheap seats, right? Jesus made this observation. And he goes, who do you guys think you are? Because at a meal, especially a Sabbath meal, it mattered where you were seated. Somebody seated at a different table in a certain spot, that was the lowest person on the pecking order. Your social prominence, your social capital, your righteousness, the, the, the greater you were as a person, the greater your community perceived you, the greater your accomplishments got you closer to the host. And so it was a pecking order type thing. They come, into the, they come into the Sabbath meal and they want the most prominent seats. So Jesus made this observation and he goes, oh, I see. What makes you think you can sit in the honored seat? And for the Pharisees, their answer would have been, well, my righteousness, of course. My goodness. My cleanliness. My morality, my ability to remain clean and undefiled, my ceremonies, my tithes, my rituals, my accomplishments. And Jesus goes, oh, how nice. You think that's what brings you honor? You think that's what makes you acceptable? Here's what happens to people who think there's someone in God's kingdom. Here's what happens to somebody who thinks there's somebody apart from God. Jesus said, look, you're going to find your place the hard way. You'll take the wrong seat, and the host will tell you to take a lower seat to your great shame. This is a kingdom economy issue, right? So I discovered this one year. I've never been told uh, to sit. I've never been told to move from my seat to take a lower seat. But I, I did one time when I was little. I did one time take the wrong gift from under the Christmas tree. Okay, so 1985. 1985, if you are a parent and you had kids around 1985, 86, you'll remember your kids wanted a Nintendo Entertainment System. Parents, can you remember that? Okay, I'm like six years old at this time, five or six years old, and I want a Nintendo and it's the gift that year. I want a Nintendo more than anything. And so we're not, at, we're not at our family's Christmas. We're at my dad's side of the family, his Christmas, right? And so I've got other cousins there, and we're picking out presents. That You know, it's the, it's the moment that we've all been waiting for. And it's little Bradley's turn to go get his present. And so I walk under the tree, and, and I pull out um, a little square box like this. And I hold it up, and, and I said, is this one for me? And my aunt comes over and she looks at it. She flips the box around and she goes, yeah, it looks like you can open this. And so I know exactly what's in my hand. It's a game. And it's for me. 
And so I sit down and I start to unwrap it. And there it is, duck hunt. And I'm going, yes, I get duck hunt. Because you know what's going to come next? If they let me open this game, my next present's going to be the system itself, right? Perfect little kid Christmas party logic. So I'm sitting there and I've got this game and I'm going, yes, I get a Nintendo. And guess what happens next? My cousin Casey, she gets to go over and she goes to the big box and she opens the Nintendo Entertainment System. And I think, wow, she gets one too. But I don't see another box that same shape. She unwraps it and there they are. And her cousin or her sister, Lindsay, they're, they're, they're celebrating. Yeah, we got a Nintendo, we got a Nintendo. And I'm doing the Christmas math because I don't see a box that shape. But what happens next is my aunt comes over and she goes, sorry, wrong gift. You're going to have to give that to your cousin Casey. Do you know how that destroys a little kid on Christmas? So I go over and I'm like, here's your stupid game, Casey. Merry Christmas. But it wasn't mine to open. It wasn't mine to take. What a terrible Christmas memory. But what a terrible way to live. So here's Jesus watching these Pharisees scramble for the places of honor. Here you are, you you proclaimed God-fearers who know that the law and the prophets testified to the greatest commandment to love God and to love others as yourself. But look at how you love your accomplishments and your status instead of people. Look at how, unlike the man who was just healed, you think your goodness makes you right. You think your goodness brings you honor. But Jesus touched and healed the unclean man who had no chance of, of being good on his own. And that's the only way you see the Lord can change us. It's not through our goodness that God looks upon us and says, that's my son, that's my daughter because he's a good person, because she's a great person. No. God looks upon those who have surrendered to Jesus' touch and says, that's my son, that's my daughter, because they received Jesus and believed in his name. And if that's what you've done, there's a better seat for you. But you don't get that seat until you surrender And stop trying to get there yourself. You see, there's a better way to live. And it's not through your works or your status. Because when we focus on those things, we're always going to be lifting ourselves up at the expense of bringing someone else down. And that is not how God's economy works. When we're called to follow Jesus, we're called to surrender the life that puts us in the middle. It's not about my works, my efforts, my cleanliness, my holiness, my feelings, or my truth that seats me next to the host. It doesn't work like that. You see, it's the host who has invited you to the banquet. It's Jesus. He's paid your entrance fee by his blood, and he imputes upon you everything that is righteous, everything that is good, and he says, welcome home, let's eat. So the next Jesus does something that would have been unthinkable. He directs his attention to the host, and then he tells the host how to host. Listen to this. Then Jesus said to the host, When you give a luncheon or dinner, do not invite your friends, your brothers or sisters, your relatives, or your rich neighbors. If you do, they may invite you back, and so you will be repaid. But when you have a banquet, invite the poor the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed. Although they cannot repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. So talking to the prominent Pharisee, he goes, what kind of life are you living? And then he lays down some kingdom economics. If you live for your reward here, you will be rewarded here. I give You give back, and that's how we go. But if that's what you want, if that's how you want to live, then you will be rewarded here accordingly. But if you live, here's the way, here's the real way of living. If you live as a kingdom citizen here, you will be rewarded there. A couple of things happen when 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 we do this. Jesus said, You will be blessed, but your reward will be less here, but greater there. Do you see how that living works? How do you want to be repaid? And who do you want to be repaid by? You want to be repaid by 
a person here or do you want to be repaid by the King of Kings and Lord of Lords at the resurrection of the righteous? So he's like, think of that. And it's kind of like this sense of delayed gratification, right? When we live kingdom ethics here, we elevate the lowly, we, we lower ourselves. That's how it works in God's economy, which is totally contrary to how we think as a culture now. But if we can look at a greater reward later, I think that helps us live accordingly here. So there was an experiment done in the early 1970s. Maybe some of you have studied this in school or, you, or you've heard of it. It's called the Stanford Marshmallow Experiment. Anybody familiar with this? Okay, so they, they grabbed a whole, well, they, they brought in a whole bunch of preschoolers. And they said, look, you can have this marshmallow. At any time, you can eat this marshmallow. Or if you wait 15 minutes, you'll get a greater reward than the marshmallow that's in front of you. Delayed gratification. What if we set our minds to something greater later? How does that impact the way we live in the, in the present, right? So you can have this treat, but you wait 15 minutes without eating the treat, you get a greater reward. Does that make sense? So they split these kids up into three groups. The first two groups had the visible reward right in front of them. They could see what they were waiting for. Group one got toys to play with to bide their time. Group two got toys to play with, plus instruction on how to mentally get through this grueling 15 minutes of waiting. Group three had the reward removed. But they still got toys, and they still got instructed on how to get past the time. And at any time, the kids could stop the experiment to take the lesser treat that was in front of them. And here's what this experiment found. They found that effective delayed gratification depended on how well the subject could suppress or avoid thinking about the reward. So the more distracted they were, the easier it was to wait. And the kids who had the hardest time were the kids who had the reward in front of them, but they couldn't stop thinking about the greater reward. They had it in front of them, the lesser treat, but they couldn't stop thinking about that greater reward. They had the hardest time waiting. And I wonder, church, if that describes us. Could it be that we are waiting for and expecting a reward that we think will truly satisfy us here? And the way we get this reward is by living for ourselves here. And you see, if that's us, we're like those kids frustrated while they wait. Like you've been going through the motions and you're waiting for the payoff, but there's nothing there. Could it be that you've been waiting for the wrong reward, desiring the wrong thing? But listen, the kids who waited for the reward that wasn't visibly present struggled less and were able to wait longer to receive their reward. That's group three. The kids who waited for the reward that wasn't present, they struggled less. That should be us, church. Not settling for a lesser reward here, but living as though a greater reward is coming later. And the way Jesus tells us to wait for this reward is by loving others with no expectation of getting something out of it for ourselves. So if you can surrender yourself and live as though life isn't about what you can get out of it now, there's a greater reward coming your way later at the resurrection of the righteous. And a litmus test for this, a litmus test for your trust in Jesus is how you treat other people, especially the ones who have nothing to offer you or can repay your goodness. Now, people around the table, I'm guessing it's pretty quiet Crickets, because they're trying to wrap their heads around this new economy that Jesus just introduced to them. And then one guy, I love this, one guy, when one of those at the table heard him say this, he said to Jesus, blessed is the one who will eat in the feast in the kingdom of God. Just to break the silence. Blessed is the one who will eat at the feast of the kingdom of God. And he knew Isaiah 26. Listen, on this mountain, the Lord Almighty will prepare a feast of rich food for all peoples, a banquet of aged wine, the best of the meats and the finest of wines. On this mountain, he will destroy the shroud that covers all nations. He will swallow up death forever. The sovereign Lord will wipe away the tears from all faces. He will remove his people's disgrace from all the earth. Now, if you read scripture, if you start in Genesis, you go even all the way through Revelation. 
a banquet, a wedding feast, a great feast. These are all things that are used to describe heaven. And the imagery is this. Imagine being at a table with the Lord who has provided everything you will ever need. That's the imagery of a banquet. So when you read that about a banquet, about a great feast in Scripture, all the way through Revelation, it's saying, look, the Lord will provide for eternity, those who trust him, everything your soul has ever desired. It's an eternity of satisfaction and it's eternity of joy. So when we read about a great feast or a banquet, that's what that's telling us. So Jesus tells them this parable. This guy goes, blessed are the ones who will eat at the kingdom of the Lord. And, and, and Jesus goes, okay, let's talk about the blessed ones, right? So I'm going to read 16 through 24. Jesus replied, a certain man was preparing a great banquet and invited many guests. At the time of the banquet, he said in his servant to tell those who had been invited, come for everything is now ready. But they all alike begin to make excuses. The first said, I've just bought a field. And I must go and see it. Please excuse me. Another said, I've, I've just bought five yoke of oxen and I'm on my way to try them out. Please excuse me. Still another said, I just got married so I can't come. The servant came back and reported this to his master. Then the owner of the house became angry and ordered his servant, go out quickly into the streets and alleys to the, of the town to bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. Sir, the servant said, what you've ordered has been done, but there is still room. Then the master told his servant, go out to the roads and country lanes and compel them to come in so that my house will be full. I tell you, not one of those who were invited will get a taste of my banquet. There's banquet protocol. So remember, 2,000 years ago, there were cultural expectations about an invite to a banquet. So listen to this. If you were going to host a banquet, you knew who, you're, you, knew who you were going to invite, and you're not going to invite somebody who's going to tell you no. You invite the best people you can think of, right? Because again, this isn't just a time to get together. This is a social thing, right? So you send your invitation out, and the response was always expected to be a yes. And a no could only be given if the guest had a reasonable excuse. And remember, this is a shame and honor society. So if you were going to say no, it was expected that it would be done in a way that would not shame you and not shame the host. To bring shame upon yourself or shame the host was like one of the biggest no-nos of the time. It still is in, those, in that part of the world today. So if you were going to give a no, it had to be a reasonable excuse. A yes or a no, whatever the thing was, you have to bring honor to both yourself and the guest, right? So that's the initial invite. There's a second invite that went out, okay? When the banquet was prepared, the animals had been killed. The wine has arrived. It's been aged. The table has been set. The servants are all in their places. Then when everything was ready to go, the second invitation went out. So everybody that was invited for the first time got the second invitation. Hey, the table's ready. It's set. Let's eat. And to say no at the second invite was an unconscionable insult. Now, you'll notice in this parable, verse 17, at the time of the banquet, he sent his servant to tell those who had been invited. So everybody, the three guys who give excuses, they've already been invited the first time. And they're giving a no answer the second time. Huge insult. So here's, here's the first excuse. And really, these are lies, okay? Here's the first excuse. I just bought a field and I must go and see it. Look, nobody buys real estate sight unseen. Nobody buys a field, especially in this part of the world, sight unseen. What you do is you go, okay, we're going to buy a field. We're going to grow things on it. Well, we need to know the soil type. 
We need to know how it's been taken care of. We need to know what's being grown now. We need to know the drainage. We need to know in this Mediterranean desert climate where the sun hits this field, what's the elevation, what's the drainage. You don't just buy a field sight unseen and then say, I'm sorry, I can't go to the banquet. I gotta go, I gotta go inspect this field that I just bought, okay? It's a lie and it's an insult. The second guy, well, I just bought five yoke of oxen and I'm there to, and I'm going to go train them. I got to try them out, right? It's the same thing as the first lie. You don't buy 27,000 pounds of oxen sight unseen. You have to know how they work together. You got to know the lineage. You have to do your homework. Then you make the purchase, right? So they're both giving this guy, the host, lame excuses. Lie number three, I just got married, so I can't come, right? Here's the bottom line. The invited guests never really wanted to attend the banquet in the first place. Here's the host offering them something that they can't do on their own, offering something good, something righteous. And every single one of them gives an excuse, maybe because they think they're fine just the way they are. Maybe they don't think, maybe they don't think they're worthy of going to the banquet. A generous invite from a generous host that was rejected using lame excuses. Could that be us sometimes? And the host, you see, who went out of his way to provide a banquet at a great cost, who was rejected (laughs) three times, has every right to respond in anger and wrath. You shame me, I'll shame you. And that would have been perfectly acceptable at the time. But instead of responding in anger, you see the host responded with grace. Oh, these guys are going to tell me no. Well, I tell you what, quick, go into the streets, go into the alleys, and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. Bring in everybody that I just told this host who to invite to his party. You bring in those guys. So the servant does it, and he goes, hey, good news. What you've asked for has been done, but there's still room. And the host goes, oh, there's room for more? Well, then go out even further. Go to the roads, go to the country lanes and compel them to come in. That's a strong word in the Greek, compel. Make it irresistible. And if they don't believe them, tell them they have to see it for themselves. Take every means necessary to get those people here. Because this isn't just any banquet. This is a matter of life and death. This changes everything. But listen, the first invitees, the first folks who were invited, they got their shot. And unless they repent, listen to this warning, not one of those who were invited will get a taste of my banquet. Yikes. But here's the grace. If you're hearing this message, the banquet's not full yet, and there's still room even for the likes of you. That's grace. Come to the banquet. There's still room for you. Repent and let's eat. Something great has been provided. Are you in or not? Now listen, again, all through Scripture, This imagery of a banquet. On this mountain, the Lord Almighty will prepare a feast of rich food for all peoples. This was your call to worship today. This was the liturgy. A banquet of aged wine, the best of meats and the finest of wines. That's from Isaiah. Come, it's for you. Turn your life around. Come to the banquet. Live life this way. Everything is provided for you. It changes everything. Come, there's a seat for you at the table. Well, I needed the rest. Sunday's our family day. I never really get to sleep in that much. Huh. 
Matthew 22. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who just gave a wedding feast for his son. Come. Well, I, I'm just not getting fed there. I was up late last night. I would have been to church, but it's finally sunny out. A certain man was preparing a great banquet and invited many guests. At the time of the banquet, he sent a servant to tell those who had been invited, come for everything is now ready. Okay, thanks for the invite. I was just there on Easter. I wasn't, I just, I just, I wanted to go, but I just wasn't feeling it this morning. I wanted to go to the banquet, but I, I need some me time. Revelation 19.9, then the angel said to me, write this, blessed are those who were invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. But we have soccer on Saturdays. We have soccer on Sundays. Blessed are those who were invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb, but the Seahawks play at 10 a.m. And I realize I'm preaching to the choir because <laughs> I know there's a game going on and you all, you are all here. God bless you. And I notice at first service at 9 a.m. I'm like, there's some Lake of Grace people back in the back because they know they're here. God bless them. But look, Jesus invites us into a life that touches eternity. Jesus invites us to follow him, and when we do that, we see the world in a different way. And Jesus said, you do that, you do that, you live by kingdom economy, your life may be hard, but there's going to be a reward later. And even in that hard living, you will be blessed. You may not see it now, but you're going to see it later. And sometimes we just say, you know what, though? Um, I'm too busy. I like my life the way it is. How come, church, how come we are so trivial and casual with what is mandatory and eternal? So we have some takeaways. I'm going to end with this. Three quick takeaways, okay? Listen, think about the Pharisees. Think about the guy who was healed. There's two ways to live, okay? You can live like the Pharisees, and you, you, can, you can count on your righteousness and your goodness. You can go for those places of honor. You can think you're something, but in the kingdom of economy, you see God turns all of that upside down. So that's one way to live. Count on what you do and, and, and hope it's good enough. Or you can live like the man who was healed. Recognize you have no other hope other than Jesus Christ and surrender to him and let Jesus do his thing. Which one is it going to be? Okay, that's the first takeaway. The second takeaway is this. Look at how Jesus told us, you know, if you follow Jesus, there's a certain way to treat other people. You cannot elevate yourself without putting somebody else down. People are not a means to an end that benefits you. And the third one here, the third one here. Look, Jesus said, compel them. Compel them to get to the banquet. Compel them. So how do we get people in here? Look, I want to let you know, Advent is right around the corner. We are a month away from Advent. December 3rd, Advent starts. Even in our home, guess what? Christmas decorations are already up. And next week, I'm putting Christmas lights up, right? Because that's, that's, that's how we do it, right? Advent is right around the corner. And, and here's the thing. We know that the greatest way to get people into the church to hear a message that is totally counter to the culture is by personal invitations. We can send out, and we do, we send out mailers uh, usually around Easter time because we want to get people here, right? Because this is where you hear hope. This is where the gospel is proclaimed. You don't hear this message outside of church, right? What you hear and what you see is a message of war and rumors of wars, of doom, of hopelessness, right? That's what you encounter out there. But what you hear and hear is the gospel. Jesus loves sinners. Jesus gave everything. He gave up his life to save sinners. There's a place for you at the banquet. Life is not done yet. God is still working. There's still room at the banquet. The door has not been shut. That's good news. That God would call the likes of us 
and redeem us through his blood so that we have an eternity where everything is satisfied and, it's, and, and death has been defeated, right? That's what we got to hear. That's what people need to hear. So how do we get them here? How do we compel people to hear that message and be changed forever, to be touched by Jesus and healed? So what we're going to do during our Advent season, the theme of Advent is everybody invite one, right? We know the statistics say people are more ready to say yes to an invitation to church around Easter and Christmas. So already we're making this as easy as possible. Now check out these, check out these statistics. This is from the Barna Institute. How do we get people in here? We know that the best way is through a personal invitation, but check this out. 76% of non-believers would welcome an invitation to church. 76% of non-believers would would welcome an invitation to church. 76%. 76% got me through public education. Those are fantastic odds. 76% of people who don't believe the gospel are going to say yes if you ask them personally. And we know that that number goes up because it's around Christmas time, okay? 76% of non-believers would welcome an invitation to church. Now listen to this. Only 5%, 5% of people were antagonistic toward those who invited them to church. Only 5%. So of all the people you can ask, you know, I think one of the reasons we don't ask, we feel uncomfortable, is because we, all of us generally carry a fear of rejection. And so we, we really, you're putting yourself out there by saying, hey, would you, would you like to come to church with me? I think you might like it. There's something there for you. I really believe this Jesus thing is real. And what we don't want is we don't want that 5% to be antagonistic toward that, right? But would you rather roll the dice and go 76% or 5% risk that 5% being antagonistic? 5% is really low. And here's the good news. If you only have one person you think you can invite, one person, then if it's 5% who are antagonistic, then out of that one person who's going to be antagonistic to you, there's only 0.05% of that person that's going to be antagonistic toward you, if that's your fear. And of the people who were invited... If you tell them, I will wait for you, and I will go in with you, that number goes up. Nobody wants to walk into a church if they've never been there alone. So if you do the personal invite, if you say, hey, I'm going to make it as easy as possible for you to come toward those doors, you see, that's compelling. Compel them to come in. So we're not trivial and casual with what is mandatory and eternal. If this Jesus thing is real, if Jesus is the hope of the world, why wouldn't we want people here? There's still room. Let's pray. God, thank you for inviting us to the table. Thank you, Lord, that you turned your anger into a moment of grace. There's still time. And so God, when those moments arise, when we concede ourselves at a place of honor, Lord, forgive us when we think too highly of ourselves. God, help us. And we pray, Lord, that during this upcoming season of Advent, that there are people who come to hear your word. I pray they are changed. I pray their eternities are altered for your glory and their good. We praise you, Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, isn't it interesting?